Hey, it's Annie Grace. I am here answering readers' questions, so let me know in the comments if you can hear me. Good to be here. Um, oh, gross. Something in my teeth. Sorry. Awkward. Um, <laughs> at least I caught it before I <laughs> embarrassed myself the entire Facebook Live. All right. Let me know if you can hear me. Great to be here. Okay. So again, it's Annie Grace, and I am here answering readers' questions. So today I have a really great question from Gina. She says, hello, I'm really enjoying the 100 Days program so very much. I love the quick hit of great information. So if you're curious, by the way, about the 100 Days program or any of our programs, you can always go to thisnakedmind.com, and everything is there for you, all of the great programs we have, which is awesome. Um, so that's great. So Gina says, I'm wondering if Annie has any done any podcast specifically on discussing her journey of going off antidepressants. I'm interested in hearing about how she weaned off, withdrawal symptoms she experienced, if any, etc. If such a podcast exists, provide me with a link. Please note, um, I'm really excited about the July alcohol experiment, and I've emailed you guys a few times, and you're always so helpful and efficient. It's much appreciated. Thank you. Ah, that's awesome, Gina. Thanks so much for all of that. So, and I'm so glad you're enjoying the 100 Days of Lasting Change. It is such a cool program. It's basically like 100 days of every day, just, you know, something that you can take or leave to help you just create lasting change in your life. And again, all of that is available at thisnakedmind.com. So my journey off antidepressants. So by the time I stopped drinking, I was taking four different medications. I was taking Wellbutrin, Escitalopram, pretty regular Xanax, and I was occasionally taking a sleep medicine. I believe it was Ambien. And so all of those medicines were combined often and all of those medicines, I believe, said do not drink when on this medicine. Yet it was two different rules, right? Because the medicine bottle would say do not drink, but the doctor would be like, oh, it's not that big of a deal. Everybody does it. And so it was kind of like what the official rule was and what was really happening in the world. And I had tried many different antidepressants over the years. I had been on antidepressants um, basically since I was about... 19 years old, I first started to go see a counselor in college when I was having a really hard time sleeping. I was really struggling. My brother had spent some time in prison, which you hear about in uh, the book, This Naked Mind. And I was really struggling at that time, knowing that he was there and all of the stuff that happened. He was still a minor. It was kind of a big mess. And in any event, it really got to me. And so I had trouble sleeping and things kind of snowballed. And all of a sudden I found myself on medication. And I took those medications pretty much until a few years before I was pregnant with my first son. So probably 19 to about 27, 28. Then I had my first son at 30. The doctors really warned me. They said, you know, since you've had depression in the past, you wanna be very careful about postpartum depression. And that's really important. And so I was like, okay, so my husband and I were like super vigilant, super hyper alert, very concerned about postpartum depression, you know, absolutely uh, checking in with me all the time. Are you doing good? Checking in all this stuff and nothing. I sailed through it. It was great. I actually, you know, he was pretty colicky and knew, you know, going from zero kids to one kid is, I think, still for me, the hardest transition, uh, even though one to two was pretty hard. Two to three actually wasn't that bad. But anyway, that was for me the hardest transition and, but it was great. And I was fine. And so I actually thought when I got pregnant with my second kid, uh, and there was about three years space in between where I was not any, on any medication, I was not on any antidepressants, and I thought when I got pregnant with my second kid, it would also be fine. I, I actually went into it completely like thinking I shouldn't even worry. So I was completely blindsided when three weeks after my second son was born, I found myself just crying on the floor of my closet, and I was so depressed. And you know, I was drinking a lot because I had felt that I had not drank for nine months, so I deserved it. And I started drinking almost immediately after he was born, and I was doing the pumping and dumping and being strategic about the last, you know, the last time I nursed and when I could drink until, and then I had to, you know, give him a bottle if he woke up before this time in the morning because then the blood, you know, the alcohol wasn't out of my milk. And I mean, it was this big, huge thing because I was really drinking seemed really important to me at that point in my life. And so I started to get back on various antidepressants and it took me a lot of tries to get something that actually made me feel good and certain things wouldn't make me sleep and certain things would, you know, make me too tired and all this sorts of stuff. So I finally found this blend of escitalopram and Wellbutrin, which were the primary things that I was taking. And then I was taking Xanax for panic attacks. And then I was taking Ambien to help me sleep, especially when I was traveling internationally. And again, all four of those things said, do not take these things with alcohol. So then I took those for quite a few years. So basically, aside from about three years, I was on and off antidepressants from 19 until 
so I stopped drinking in 2014 and then I about a year after I stopped drinking was when I really started to feel good enough to get off my antidepressants and interestingly I would credit my antidepressants with helping me get to a place where I was ready to consider stopping drinking I think that was really important because I was drinking to self-medicate in a big way at that point in time before my second son was born after he was born and it just kept escalating and escalating and not a social thing anymore it was really just to survive my life i thought alcohol was the duct tape that was keeping everything together this big job that i had and my marriage and my kids and all of this stuff when really it was contributing to my anxiety and i didn't know that not even a little bit and so through that uh experience i had been on antidepressants for you know a, a humongous amount of time and about a year after I stopped drinking, I started noticing certain things. First of all, I wasn't, didn't have any plans to get off my antidepressants. That wasn't really part of or any reason why I was getting off, uh, you know, wanted to stop drinking. As, as you know from my journey, I just really showed myself, according to science and research and my own experiences, that alcohol wasn't doing any, me any favors anymore. And so I got off the, the, the first inklings for me to want to get off the antidepressants came about a year later. And what happened was I started to notice that I wasn't crying at certain things I maybe used to cry for, or I wasn't feeling quite as good as maybe I was. And because you start to live so awake when you stop drinking, and that's such a gift, even though, by the way, it doesn't always feel like a gift at the beginning because the world is raw and it's intense and it's vibrant and it has ups and downs and pain and beauty. And, you know, Glennon Doyle, she calls it brutal, like beautiful and brutal all at once in one single word, brutal. And it's such a good description of what life can be like. And so you're living awake and raw and exposed and it's all this good, you know, intense, beautiful, glory, painful insanity that is life. And that is amazing, but it can be very, very intense. And I started to realize about a year later, I didn't think I was experiencing all of the emotions I wanted to experience. And I just felt so content that I was really wanting to explore getting off those antidepressants. So I went and I started talking to my doctor and I started seeing a naturopath. And that was phenomenal for me. He ended up doing some blood tests and, and running some different tests and stuff. And I found out through him that I was actually slightly hypoglycemic. And But I had you know this habit of not eating until just forgetting meals or skipping meals or not eating. And I think a lot of it came from when I was drinking. I just was so focused on alcohol. I wasn't eating a lot. And that kind of continued on after I stopped drinking. And one of the most pivotal things when I started to get off the antidepressants and my anxiety did start to come back, there started to be places where I was quite anxious. And by the way, I still do experience anxiety and I could go back on antidepressants for it probably, but I don't want to, I want to live this way now. And I don't think there's anything wrong with antidepressants just to be really clear, but it was just something that I was like, you know, I want to experience this even if it's intense. And so I started to feel some I think there was, it's hard for me to remember exactly what the withdrawal symptoms were, but I do think that there was some very, you know, it, there was some intensity about it and there was, it's a transition. I mean, your body's so used to taking certain things. It's certainly a transition. And I did one at a time. I think I did the escitalopram first. And then I think I did the, um, I stopped taking the Xanax pretty quickly. That wasn't something that, since that was an occasional ad hoc thing, that was something that was pretty easy to stop taking. And I stopped taking the Ambien. Uh, that was also at a point in time where I stopped traveling internationally, which was one of the main reasons I was taking the Ambien because I was on the overnight flights and I need to rest or I was trying to adjust to, you know, different time zones and whatnot. So that had less to do with me actually not have, having really deep problems sleeping, but just actually me uh, doing all that travel. And I had stopped doing that travel. So I'd stopped taking that. And those were, were pretty easy. I didn't experience any withdrawal symptoms. But the hardest one for me was the Wellbutrin. That took me a while to wean off of and to feel good about. And it was, I did gain weight. Wellbutrin is um, a drug that makes you really not hungry. And so I did gain weight because I got my appetite back. I don't actually think that was a bad thing at that point in time, but it was really true and apparent. And it was just something that was really interesting to note for me. But the things that I did, I think more relevant than the specifics of my withdrawal symptoms were the things that I added into my life that I believe create really good mental health for me on a day-to-day -day basis. And those things are number one, according to that naturopath in my blood test, 
I was slightly hypoglycemic, which means that my blood sugar would really dip. And so he had me start to drink a protein shake every morning, to have nuts on my desk, and to just drink, eat small amounts of protein throughout the day. That for me has made like a world of difference. And there's so many reasons for that, but just basically your blood sugar evens out and balances out. And it, had, it was incredible, that change for me just going from skipping meals and not eating to eating protein on a really regular basis, even if it's just a few nuts or I love apple with almond butter or apple with peanut butter, stuff like that. Huge, huge difference for me. So that was one thing. Another thing was I started mindfulness. I started with just 15, 30 seconds a day, a few times a day, I'd set my alarm. And when it would go off, I would stop and I'd be like, okay, I just want to be present in this moment. I'd look around me and I'd be like, okay, the sun is out and I feel myself in this chair feel my hair on my shoulders. I feel, I would just feel where I was, just observe it a few times a day and just bring myself back into my body. That was amazing for me. And that despite being, me being resistant to meditation for years and years and years was actually something that created in me a desire to learn to meditate. And now I do meditate on a, on a regular basis, uh, daily, if not twice a day, which has been incredible. And the science behind the relationship with anxiety and depression and meditation is really fascinating. Meditation is one of the things that can actually grow your prefrontal cortex, like literally grow the gray matter in your brain. And so from a overcoming addiction perspective, the prefrontal cortex is vital. It's one of the things that gets absolutely hijacked when you are in that cycle. And from just a happiness perspective, uh, meditation is phenomenal. And then exercise. I really dedicated myself to, it was running at the time. Now we live in a place that's super hilly, so I don't run. I have a Peloton though. And I do um, Taekwondo three times a week. I also do uh, weightlifting, stuff like that. So pretty much every single day. And I think to put all these habits in place, I, I call alcohol actually the big domino because it was, I wanted to be an exerciser for years. I wanted to eat more healthy for years. I wanted to, you know, do yoga or, or do all this stuff. And then, but it was like fits and starts. And then alcohol knocked out of the way and all of this stuff very naturally came into my life. And here's the thing. <laughs> I think this is the crux of it all. We want a pill to make us feel better. And I get that. And I have nothing against pills. To make us feel better. I think there's really a lot of chances and a lot of cases where we are imbalanced. We do need them. And I'm certainly not a doctor, so I'm never going to advise you otherwise. But I will tell you that in my experience, my resistance was to the fact, do I really have to do all of these things every single day to feel okay? Do I have to do it every day? Is it really so daily? Are you kidding me right now? I'm going to have to meditate and exercise and eat a protein shake and eat nuts. And I'm going to have to do all of this stuff every day. And so I just had to have kind of a pity party or a morning thing for the fact that, yeah, yeah, to be really well adjusted and happy in my life, I have to do certain things every single day. And then, you know what? I also have to eat every single day. I also have to go to the bathroom every single day. You know, I also have to brush my teeth. Those are things that I just made normal. Why can't these things be normal too? And it took some, you know, transition and really my act technique to help me overcome some of my thoughts around that. But eventually it also did become normal. And so for me, the journey off antidepressants was so much more about what I added into my life in terms of harnessing my thoughts and really questioning them in terms of exercise and meditation than what I was taking away, which was the pharmaceuticals. So that is my journey. Happy to answer any additional questions. Like to be an open book about this stuff because I think it's so helpful. I do believe that if it wasn't for the medicine I was on, I probably wouldn't have gotten stable enough to be able to look at my drinking as honestly as I did in order to make that change. I also believe that if I was to continue drinking, there's no way I would have experienced enough kind of happiness and uh, lack of anxiety to even question the medication I was on and to make the progress getting off of it because alcohol was truly, as I've heard it said, the gasoline uh, for the flame of my anxiety. It was like just pouring gasoline on it. So anyway, I hope that helps. And if you're curious about any of our programs, again, especially the 100 Days of Lasting Change, which Gina loves so much, you can find all of that at thisnakedmind.com. Have a great day.